So uh, before I begin, I just wanted to explain a little why I chose this photo, which was for Frank, which is uh, taken from his Facebook page. And I think it's, you know, to me it represents the ambiguity of Frank's relationship to, te to technology. You know, what's going on here? It definitely looks like Frank's trying to take a quick self-portrait using his own, you know, laptop camera, but he can't quite figure out how to <laughs> tilt it, right? So, you know, is it... Is that what is you know, actually going on? For, for those of us who spent many hours serving as Frank's personal IT assistant, that certainly <laughs> seems plausible, right? But then, you know, he's kind of got that mischievous smile. So maybe, you know, he's thinking that by posting this kind of off-centered photo, you know, um, that onto his Facebook page, that it's really, you know, a, a social commentary about, you know, the, the inherent narcissism of social media or something like that. Um, and then maybe he just, you know, the third option, of course, is that he just tried it once real quick to take the photo, didn't come out, and he's like, enough with this bullshit. <laughs> and just, you know, slammed the laptop down and got, up, you know, got on to whatever else he was going to do. So, you know, to me, this, this captures Frank in a little snapshot. And um, I guess, you know, I want to start just explaining a little bit about the history of the multimedia study environment. And I guess, you know, it, I'll start all the way in the beginning, which is that, you know, it's uh, it, maybe it sounds a little bit cliche to say that uh, you know, I wouldn't be here without Frank, but literally I wouldn't be here without Frank because he introduced my parents. And so um, I owe a lot to Frank, including, you know, every moment I, uh, that I live. So, but, you know, thinking about what, you know, some of the speakers said in the, in the earlier panel, especially what, what Josh said, you know, is I was one of those kids you know, that he, he touched at an early age and really, ins you know, inspired to be, you know, uh, not just a learner, but somebody who, who is really interested in the practice of learning. Um, and, you know, it started off, you know, I mean, I knew, you know, Franco growing up, but when I was in high school, he actually invited me to Dalton to the new lab where I got to see Archetype in action and just, you know, it, that was a kind of transformative moment because I realized, you know, the potential for kind of new forms of, of education really transforming learning and I was, I was, I was sold, I, was, I bought in. And so then I went to you know, Columbia um, nearby as an undergraduate and I was um, you know, studying philosophy, which I'm sure you know, made Frank happy too, um, as a classicist. But you know, he, he invited me to work as an intern um, at the new lab and um, you know, I got a lot of hands-on experience there. And then when I graduated, he said, you know, he had just moved from, the, from Dalton to Teachers College um, and was working at the Institute for Learning Technology and, and as a professor with Rob Robbie and about to start the center. Um, and he said, you know, I wasn't, you know, as a philosophy major, I, I had no plans, of course. A and uh, <laughs> he said, why don't you come study with me and Robbie? So I thought, you know, let's keep, let's keep the party going. And uh, so we start, I started at the Institute for Learning Technologies in the summer of 98. And um, basically, Ro Robbie Im immediately got me involved in this project um, along with uh, Jinx Roosevelt um, that had to do with um, coming up with a way of um, really interrogating um, scholarly texts more deeply online. And so he, the, the first text that, we, that Robbie was, was experimenting with was um, The Emile by Rousseau. And, in, and Frank wasn't in, in involved at this point, but this was really um, a precursor to the multimedia study environment that he had so much influence in shaping. And so this is kind of what it looked like. Basically, there was, um, you know, the main text was always kind of in this central frame in the middle of the window. And then there was a kind of annotation window on the lower left, which could be used to kind of quickly link out to um, content, you know, author's notes that were produced by Rousseau himself, or by um, actual original content that was being produced by um, Jinx Roosevelt at the time. And, you know, so, f you know, Frank saw this and I think immediately realized the potential um, for expanding this, not just for a way of kind of interrogating scholarly texts as a scholar, but also to really allow, you know, college students and students who, who weren't yet necessarily scholars themselves to basically develop the basic understanding and, and to kind of accumulate the background knowledge that was necessary to really penetrate really difficult to um, process texts. 
And so what he, the first text that he thought about using this for was um, on an essay by Friedrich Jameson, uh, Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, which is, you know, I'm not sure how many people took um, Frank's theory of communications course and had to read this text, but it's an extremely dense. <laughs> Show of hands, how many people? Oh, let's see. Yeah, a good, a good portion. And so, um, you know, you get passages like this, which, you know, the enumeration of what follows then at once became, becomes empirical, chaotic, and heterogeneous Andy Warhol and pop art, but also photorealism and beyond, and the new expressionism, the moment in the music of John Cage, blah, 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 blah. So you get, you know, within, you know, one or two sentences, it, uh, you know, a litany of references to things that most um, beginning graduate students at Teachers College would, would not be familiar with at all. And so, and without really, I mean, the language is dense to begin with, but without necessarily being, having an image in mind when you think about um, Andy Warhol's um, diamond dust shoes or, you know, to understand the kind of musical influence of John Cage or, or Philip Glass, it's really hard to kind of parse the argument. So what we um, did, um, Frank and I, and also um, another student, Dave Garfinkel, at the time we were both taking Frank's class, is to basically um, put the postmodernism text into a kind of version of the template that we had been playing around with um, Robbie and the Emil. And you got something that looked like this. So let me actually give you a little quick live demo of this. So this is the first, um, whoops, wrong one. This is an homage to Frank that I would click on the wrong one. <laughs> um, there we go. Oh. There we go. So um, this is an archive. For, this hasn't been really updated. So some of the features still aren't quite working like they used to. But basically, the idea is that you, you know, you don't navigate by pages. You might navigate by specific paragraphs, which are anchored here in the text. You can get to any particular paragraph by, you know, typing in a number here, or from a lot of the other, um, for instance annotations that you can click on in a text will actually allow you to link back to all the places within the main text where it's actually cited. So it's this way of kind of instantly navigating, you know, back and forth from an index to the main text and to be able to kind of make some strong connections between concepts that are um, weaved throughout a very long discourse. Um, we color coded the links so you kind of, you could go through and you could kind of had a sense before you clicked on something about what kind of reference or resource you'd be getting by clicking on it. Um, you know, so we have autobiography, I mean, sort of biographical information, conceptual information, artworks, author's notes. Um, just to give you a quick idea of this is the Andy Warhol, Andy Warhol um, annotation. You could click on it, you can get uh, some of the key images um, that are referenced in the text get a little slideshow without necessarily having to leave um, the, the, the actual study environment itself to, in, to navigate out into the, the kind of wild west of the World Wide Web. Um, there was also, you know, a lot, plenty of other kinds of navigational routes. You could um, get to the author notes from here. You could, um, you can get, you know, to, to, you could link directly to the various annotations through these kinds of indexes. Um, and so, let me go back. So what was the kind of educational benefit of, of a text like, or of a of study environment like this? Um, so I think, you know, there's several. I mean, this is weird, where I, I, you know, currently a professor in educational developmental psychology. So, so you know, I'm gonna see, you know, I see the connections differently now that I've you know, spent a lot of time since working on this um, in this particular field. But I think one of the key ways that it really helps learners is it, is it provides students with the kind of necessary back, background knowledge that they need for deep comprehension. This is one of, you know, the most robust findings in educational psych psychology, which is that prior knowledge is really fosters deep comprehension, and not just because it, um, you know, is allowing you to understand just some of the kind of tertiary references, but because it actually allows you to connect some of the basic ideas um, um, in a more integrated way with your existing knowledge and really, you know, to kind of grasp what's going on. 
Um, at the same time, it allows access to all of this background knowledge while minimizing demands on kind of working memory. There's only so much that we can kind of keep in our in consciousness at any given time. Um, and if you were to have to basically, every time you wanted to look up a reference, you know, go to the library and dig up, you know, a, a huge reference book or even to kind of go out into the World Wide Web and, and, and search for a few minutes to find, you know, what it is you're looking for, um, there's going to be a disjunction, you know, it's going to be, you're, you're, or rather I should say, it's going to, you're good, it's going to be disjointed experience to the, to the extent that you're, you're no longer focusing on the, the thread of the argument by the author. Now you're kind of using up mental resources, you know, on just, just trying to locate what it is you need. And that really interferes with the kind of learning I think that Frank thought was important. Um, but, you know, what are the dangers of this kind of environment? You know, the, I mean, clearly, I think what, what Tom said is, is right, that, you know, the danger of the web was always that, like Sven Burkett said, is that it's, it's, it's really, it can be really shallow at times. I mean, there's, there's a lot there, but, but it kind of leads, you know, individual learners on this kind of wild goose chase. So, um, and to kind of follow their own, you know, bliss through the content as opposed to really focusing and, and having to wrestle with the message of the author. And so I think um, this is what Frank had in mind when he said the, this is actually a quote from an article that he wrote with John Frankfurt here, um, which, was, which is about, um, a lot about the, 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 the multimedia study environments in general, but also more specifically about the multimedia study environment for Malcolm X Project, which I'll talk about in a minute. But he said collectively, this architecture is intended to give the reader and researcher maximum flexibility to penetrate the text's referential universe. Um, pursue excursus of study through links to both online library resources and reference works, and at the same time, maintain attention um, on, the, on the primary object of study. And so I could put up this, this little diagram because I think this is the kind of metaphor Frank used to use of this idea of these kind of concentric bands of content. Everything always relates back to the core text. The core text is always in that central frame and you can't really, you, know, you, you, you never actually get away from it. All content pops up in relation to that central frame. So the core text is the anchor, it's the spine. The annotations, you know, are the kind of um, the content that we hand pick for this particular learning environment for the learning experience and it surrounds the core text and it links out to particular multimedia, original source content that's useful um, for understanding the text. And then only at that point does it link out to external resources in the, in the web, so if you want to do further um, kind of, um, you want to navigate certain um, information further, you can do so on your own, but we make it kind of, you know, a couple steps to get to so that you, you're not necessarily just let out on this kind of, um, this kind of winding path and you, you're, you're, you're constantly focusing back on the text itself. Um, so quickly, i just take you through a few iterations. Like as Marie said, there's, um, maybe 17 now, multimedia study environments. Um, and in the early days, each new multimedia st study environment that we created um, basically added some slightly new functionality, which I, th and also targeted slightly different audiences in a way that really expanded um, the use and purpose of, of the study environment. So I, I'm just gonna highlight a few. I, the first one I think to, to show is the, I'm not gonna actually, I'm just gonna show you a picture of it, is from, um, W.E. Du Bois, The Souls of Black Folk. And what was important about this particular multimedia study environment was not just some of the new kind of technological features that we had, more video and that you could link out, you know, in the kind of marginalia of the text, you could link out to particular resources as opposed to just clicking on w links from particular phrases or words. But more the fact that, that it was, a, it was the first MSC, I think, to really, um, not just make use of existing content, but to actually go out and actively generate new content um, and to harness the intellectual resources here at Columbia University. So um, this was uh, in partnership with Alan Brinkley and, and Casey Blake and um, Manning Marable, Robert O'Mealy. And, and they, you know, we, I think there was a lot of videos um, of, of them being interviewed specifically about the text. So it was a way, first of all, to bring scholars um, together from multiple departments um, and have them all kind of participate along a, a, around a central work that essentially operates, again, not just this time as um, 
a central text for um, aligning the, the student's attention um, in, in a, for a particular, in, within a particular learning experience, but for, for aligning the research efforts of multiple um, participants around the university. And then with the, uh, another MSC, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that scope expanded even more broadly to outside the university. This was the first time that I think um, Frank began to envision study environments that would be uh, generally useful to a larger community, um, one that had a kind of, this had a kind of global outreach and created a community of users, um, and these are his words, that's given a powerful life outside the university where it supports courses in the area of human rights and international studies. Um, then um, another important study environment was for Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children. This was part of a project in which um, we partnered with the School of the Arts, who was putting on a, um, a play, um, a theatrical uh, version of Salman Rushdie's um, celebrated novel, Midnight's Children. And so what, 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 what the innovation here was is that, as opposed to just having a single text spine, actually having um, kind of dual spines of the text and the play, and you could kind of juxtapose them by going back and forth and you had annotations that allowed you to make connections between these two um, primary source materials. So in a sense, it, it was a, a way of taking two separate lenses onto the same content, which really became important um, for the Malcolm X MSc, which I think of as a kind of culmination um, of a lot of the, the work Frank did on these multimedia study environments. And I'm not going to just for sake of time, go too deeply into um, this. But let me just show you one thing, which is, which I think was really one of the critical um, additions to this kind of learning environment was the fact that there were these m multiple, well, first of all, let me just back up for a second. I think what was, was uh, this project was kind of culmination of, of all four of those MSCs that I just showed you. One, because it brought together um, a, a really interesting array of scholars throughout the university, especially bringing together the center and um, Manning Marable's team um, at Columbia. And, and there was really a dual effort to, to really build the technology in a way that really supported the kind of research efforts that they were engaged in. Um, second, it was meant as a research tool that could be used by people outside of the university um, as well to really, for, for, for both as students who really wanted to understand Malcolm X's autobiogra autobiography better, but at the same time to really, um, for scholars who, who really wanted to interrogate the text and go deeper, it has you know, an amazing array of resources. Just to show you quickly, you know, we have original FBI files here. You, in, in some cases, you can show, you can compare the redacted versions with the unredacted versions. Um, you have archival footage of Malcolm X himself, all, all the major players at the time. You have um, an, an assassination case file. They actually have the contents of Malcolm X's pockets at the moment that he was shot. Um, so you have a, this amazing access to primary source material in addition to um, some secondary sources and interpretive material. But, you know, and with this a huge amount of content, it, it becomes a question of how to guide the students through the text. And what they came up with is this idea of lenses. So you can see here that which links become highlighted in the text depends on which of these tabs is highlighted. So you can kind of, um, you, can, you can have a different kind of guided tour through the text that still allows for a high degree of flexibility and interactivity. Um, but one that's kind of curated in several different ways. And you know, by clicking on to any particular annotation, you can also move between these different lenses as well and always get back to the original text. So just briefly, and this again, some quotes from Frank, the, the Malcolm X MSc was, or multimedia study environment, was really a culmination of a lot of the work that he had done and for the following reasons. First, it allowed users to switch between these lenses or critical readings of the text. 
Um, second, the, the rich you know, repository of primary resource materials allows researchers to both critique the Haley narrative as well as to build their own. Um, it also led to the creation of original content in the forms of interviews of, of peers and associates, associates with uh, Malcolm X. And uh, it provided direction and resources for future research. So briefly, just in, in ending, I want to mention one thing that he talks about at the end of the, the paper that he wrote with John. And that is, he, t he addressed the idea of the digital divide. And he talked about you know, the classic notion of the digital divide as being one of you know, technology because of the, you know, the cost of actually implementing certain kinds of technologies within the classroom can kind of reinforce certain kinds of class and race divisions within education. But he said that there's an, another digital divide, and then certainly that was a digital divide that he was very concerned with addressing. But this is another one, which was um, that between the student or the researcher and the expanded universe of knowledge and information. And here I just want to read two quotes from Frank. And you know, but the great thing about the way that Frank writes is that he writes like he talks. So you can you should be able to hear his voice as I read through this. Um, you know, one response is to focus on the design of tools of engagement that would position the student and scholar less as an observer and more as an excavator and an artist with a capacity to seamlessly capture, analyze, organize, and produce knowledge objects of their own. And then another is represented by the Malcolm X MSC, which provides a domicile for individuals with a specific interest, a domicile which is a pathway to a larger universe of emerging knowledge. Thanks.